Welcome to Australian Hiker, your online hiking resource. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage. This is episode 134 of the Australian Hiker podcast. And in this week's episode, we're going to be talking about choosing a sleeping bag. Now, when assembling your hiking kit for overnight or multi-day hiking, the tent, sleeping bag and pack are generally the three heaviest and often the three most expensive pieces of equipment you carry. And together they make up as what is known as the big three. Now, the problem when choosing a sleeping bag is the huge range of choice we have available on the market. There are dozens and dozens of sleeping bags that are all good quality that you have to choose from. And in today's episode, we're going to look at what they are and hopefully it will help you uh, make things a bit easier in your choice. We hope you enjoy. Now, the first one we're going to talk about is warmth. Uh, And this decision is really probably at the top of your choice as far as a sleeping bag is concerned. Whether it's summertime or wintertime, you're going to need something that provides an appropriate amount of warmth. And even if you are hiking in the desert, so I'll use here the Larapinta Trail in the Northern Territory, it's not unusual to have 30 degree plus daytime temperatures and zero degree nighttime temperatures. So you do need to choose something that is going to go through and keep you warm for the expected minimum temperature you're going to be going through and dealing with. And I think the other thing to remember in relation to warmth is that when when you're sleeping, you're still. <laughs> so you're not keeping yourself warm um, as you do during the day when you're moving about and there's the opportunity to find a little bit of sun to, to warm up uh, if the day is cool. So, you know, I think we sometimes underestimate um, how cool our, our body temperature actually gets um, if we don't have the right kind of clothing or the right kind of um, protective layer. Now, one helpful piece of information you can use in your selection of the sleeping bag is the EN13537 rating system. This is a European system that's accepted worldwide and it provides a standardised um, process or a standardised system of temperature ratings for sleeping bags uh, that are manufactured or sold in Europe. Now, having said that, this does my head in, seriously. I just struggle with this. But anyway, we'll keep going. It's a standard. Just have to remember that. Now, we did say it's a European system and bags that are sold in Europe and and manufactured in Europe, but it's something that's widely used in Australia uh, and it's becoming more widely accepted in the United States as well. However, there are still some bag manufacturers that don't use this system and will give a rating to their bag but the, it's it's not a matter of comparing apples with apples here. So you do need to know that the mat, the bag you are looking at is using this standard. Otherwise, you might not be getting what you think you're going to be getting. Now, this system uses a standardized series of temperature tests uh, using a thermal mannequin with heaters and temperature sensors to measure the insulation value of the sleeping bag. These tests are carried out with a mannequin wearing one layer of long underwear, which is placed inside the sleeping bag on an insulating pad typical of those used when camping. The test is conducted in a temperature-controlled chamber, and a range of temperatures are derived from measuring the energy required to maintain a stable temperature. And there are typically four figures that are derived from these tests. Now, the first one, which is the upper limit, you don't normally see on sleeping bags. And this figure is um, uh, is one which says that a standard man can sleep without excessive perspiration. Whatever a standard man is. I don't yeah, know. and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Whatever excessive perspiration is. The, the ratings that you do tend to see on sleeping bags these days, uh, the first one is a comfort rating, and this is the temperature at which a standard woman, and we'll talk about that again in a moment, can expect to sleep comfortably in a relaxed position. If you're a male and a cold sleeper, use this rating to decide the coldest temperature of which the sleeping bag is suitable for you. 
The lower limit, and this is the temperature at which a standard man can sleep for eight hours in a curled position without waking. Um, if you're a male, a warm male sleeper, this is a, a good rating to use to decide on how cold you can take the bag down to. Typically, women won't find this to be very comfortable. Um, females do feel the cold uh, differently than men do, uh, and a bag that a male is quite happy and comfortable in warmth-wise isn't necessarily going to suit uh, the average woman, uh, but it may do. Then we go down to the extreme, and this is a survival-only rating for women. Uh, and between the lower limit and the extreme rating, a strong sensation of cold has to be expected. There's a risk of health damage due to hypothermia or possibly frostbite, but you will still survive. Um, so worst case situation, if you're caught out in a blizzard or a snowstorm, you know, at least this gives you an indication of what uh, what the extreme protection is likely to be. Now, using this standard, um, you really have to think about whether you are a cold sleeper or a warm sleeper uh, and what sort of clothing you usually wear uh, when you're camping. So as we said, these tests uh, for this uh, standard are done with a mannequin wearing a set of uh, long thermal top and a, a long thermal pants. Um, but yeah, you may vary. You may sleep with nothing. You may sleep with a full set of clothes. You may sleep with a number of layers. And you've got to go through and consider what your normal sleeping pattern is. Uh, these will all go through and contribute to um, your comfort when you're sleeping in the outdoors. Now, we did talk about a standard man and a standard woman. Uh, and really, this standard specifies the age, weight, and height of what a standard man and woman are. And I must admit, I looked at this and I don't fall into this category. I'm not a 25-year-old male that weighs around about 80, 85 kilos. Uh, so for me, um, it doesn't quite fit. Uh, so as we said, it really is a method of testing one sleeping bag against another uh, rather than saying, well, you're a standard male or a standard female and it will suit you fine. Yeah, and I think from my experience, I know that if there's a particular temperature for the the woman's uh, rating, I probably sit above that by a couple of degrees. So, for example, if it says it's a bag that goes down to minus four degrees, um, I probably would take it down to minus one, and then I might add um, other things like clothing or a thermal bag liner or something like that to get it to minus four. For me, I use a two degrees Celsius bag for all but my coldest hikes, uh, and I'll just add layers of clothing as I need. Uh, and once I start getting down to nighttime temperatures of probably about minus three, uh, roughly minus four degrees, I'll swap over to a, a heavier grade bag. Or, or you'll steal my thermal lining. <laughs> that, work, that works as well. Uh, but as I said, I tend to uh, not feel the cold as much and I can get by with a, a much warmer bag than Jill can. Now, if you've decided to buy just one bag to meet all your needs, uh, then you're going to have to go through and compromise. Uh, it's no good having a bag which you're cold in the majority of time. Uh, if anything, what you need to do is, is look at purchasing a bag that is going to keep you warm at its coldest. Uh, and that means when it's really hot in the middle of summer, you might be a bit warm, but you know you might open up the zips, um, open up the foot box to let, it, let air in. Uh, you, uh, you may well go through and um, uh, unzip the bag altogether and just use it as a, uh, as a blanket. Uh, so you're better off having a bag that's slightly on the warm side, but as long as it caters for the coldest hiking that you're likely to do. Alternatively, like me, you can have multiple bags and choose the bag that suits the conditions that you're going to be hiking in. I knew you were going to say that that was a good thing. <laughs> It is a bit of a luxury and it's not one that everyone can afford or necessarily wants, uh, but certainly from my perspective, my ideal is to have a bag at around about the two degree level and then one around about the minus four level and that will cover pretty much everything I want to do. Now you'll find that most bags sold in Australia these days will have this EN rating actually printed on the bag, either on a label or printed on the bag itself, uh, and you can look at... Uh, 
um, what that bag, what individual bags will do. And we've given an example on the written version of this podcast. So the next thing we're going to do is look at shape. And there are three um, main shapes uh, to sleeping bags. The first one is rectangular, which as it sounds is a rectangle. Um, it has lots of space. Um, it's usually bulkier and usually heavier. So the next one is a tapered rectangular um, sleeping bag, which is a combination of the rectangular and the mummy form that we'll be talking about in a, in a minute. It has uh, more space Space at the expense of greater airflow, but not as much as the full rectangular bag. So it's a little bit more form fitting, um, but not cozy. Um, and then the next one is the mummy or the form fitting bag. And this means that there's minimal space um, around you, uh, which is great for keeping you warm, but for larger people or for people who are restless sleepers, that can be a, a bit of a problem because it's hard to move about within the sleeping bag. Now, I must admit, I um, I bought my first mummy bag probably around about um, three years ago, and it, it actually surprised me. I mean, I'm a reasonably large guy. I have large feet, uh, and I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting to see how this bag goes. Um but I did buy the long length bag, so it's not. I wasn't jammed up against the end of the bag. I find I've got plenty of space. The bag has very minimal amounts of air floating around inside it, so uh, I found that I, I warm up much quicker in a mummy sleeping bag than I do in a relaxed or a rectangular bag. Um, and I, when I roll over, I don't roll over inside the sleeping bag. I roll over with the sleeping bag. It, it moves with me. Yeah, I was going to say that I think that's the trick with the mummy bags. It's to take the bag with you rather than try and spin around in the middle of it. And I think <laughs> You a, get stuck. <laughs> and it's not actually a bad thing because really when you think about it, most bags have hoods on them. Uh, and if you turn around and leave the bag where it is, it means you're facing into the you side suffocate, of the, the yeah. hood. You're suffocating. <laughs> so... Um, I mean, I think the mummy bags don't always suit everybody and people don't like the claustrophobic feel, uh, but I'm pretty much sold on them. I think uh, they are more compact, they're lighter in weight, um, but you either like them or you don't. Yeah, my bag at the moment is a tapered rectangular bag and there's probably um, probably a bit too much room to move about, which... Um, means that uh, there's a lot of airflow, particularly in the lower part of the bag, um, and it's a very long bag as well. So, you know, I'm probably thinking it's time to uh, retire that one and get something new. Now we've moved on from shape, we're going to go talk about down versus synthetic, and this is the type of material that fills the bag, and it's essentially what provides the warmth. Uh, now, once you've decided on a temperature rating and a shape, then you need to look at the type of insulation material you're going to be using. Uh, and as we said, currently there are two main choices of insulation material, the down, uh, which comes from ducks or geese, uh, or synthetic. The choice here with duck or geese down probably comes down to quality in most cases. So the very high quality down tends to come from geese, there are less geese worldwide. There is less source of it. Uh, and certainly over the last 12 months, there's been reports of shortage uh, as people move away from eating ducks and geese uh, and, and the popularity of down grows. So it means that um, the high quality down tends to be more expensive. Down is um, a lighter weight material. It's easy to compress to a smaller size. It does really well in cold, dry conditions, uh, and it has a longer lifespan if looked after. Uh, and in fact, my first down bag I got rid of in, I think it was around about 1992, uh, and I got that when, uh, I don't think I got that in um, around about 1970. So 22 years now it um, 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 it was pretty cozy by the time you got rid of it, Tim. I think you were a little bit bigger than you were in 1970, and it had lost a bit of down by that stage, so it wasn't particularly warm. But you know, it looked pretty much new. 
Now well, the, that's the main thing, I guess. Yeah. Now, the disadvantages of down is it can be expensive and quite often it can be twice the comparable price of a th- synthetic bag. It's slow to dry when it gets sopping wet. It doesn't perform well in conditions where the bag's always going to be wet and there's no chance of it drying out. Now, you'll often see um, descriptors associated with down bags such as loft or fill power, and this describes the quality of the down material. The higher the loft, the warmer and lighter the bag, but also the more expensive. So the best quality bags have 850 plus loft, um, which is reflected in the price. Cheaper down bags have a loft figure that's much lower, either 750 or 650. Um, it makes the bag cheaper, but typically that will mean the bag is going to be heavier in weight. So the same weight of a higher loft will fill a larger area. And we've got a photo in the written version of this podcast. Uh, and when we, we basically what it amounts to is one ounce of 650 loft down will fill 650 cubic inches of space um, uh, as opposed to one ounce, so same weight of 850 uh, loft down will fill 850 uh, uh, cubic inches uh, of space. Now what that means is two bags that weigh the same, one with 650 uh, loft down and one with 850 loft down, the 850 loft bag will be much uh, much warmer. Or alternatively, you get away with the less down, which means the bag is lighter overall. Most modern bags these days will contain a down fill that is treated so it's water repellent, and the word here is repellent rather than waterproof. Um, so down bags that are treated these days really will provide um, uh, a barrier against condensation or wetting as opposed to dunking the thing in a river or a bath. Um, so it really does do very well. Now, synthetic bags, which are the other option, they use a synthetic material. They're quick drying. They insulate when they're sopping wet. They're non-allergenic. They're less expensive and they're more robust. So this is often the reason they tend to be used as school bags or bags that you tend to hire. Uh, They just take a bit more of a pounding. The disadvantage with this is that they tend to be bulkier and heavier uh, when compared to a similar down bag. Uh, and they actually have a shorter lifespan uh, as well. But again, not too much of a, a li- shorter lifespan, but they won't last as long as if you look after a good quality down bag for a period of years. So next thing we're going to look at is features. And uh, pretty much I think this is where the design of the sleeping bags come into play. Um, and uh, the manufacturers really do want to distinguish themselves um, by providing a whole range of different features. So the first and probably obvious one is a sleeping bag hood. Um, if you're in a warmer conditions, you probably don't ne- necessarily need a hood, um, but for most other conditions, having a hood that you can uh, draw in and tuck around your head is, is um, a great option. Uh, and the reason is that most of the heat uh, gets lost out of the top of your head. So um, you're either wearing a beanie or something like that or you're tucking your sleeping bag hood over the top of your head uh, to minimise the heat loss. Another option is the bag length. And uh, sometimes this is, you know, called regular, long, extra long. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, women's and men's um, or... Or unisex these days. Or unisex, yeah. So um, it really doesn't matter. Um, Basically the important thing is to find the length that suits uh, you. Um, I often find that the, the bags that are sold as women's bags are probably about 170 centimetres ish uh, in length, which means that if you're particularly tall, um, it's not going to be very helpful for you. You you won't be able to tuck inside a sleeping bag. One thing, though, that uh, will often vary with women's bags, again, they make assumptions here. Women's bags will often be shorter. They'll often be wider in the hip area uh, and slightly narrower in the chest area. Uh, on the assumption that that's what the shape of that's women shape is. Of women, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a male using a woman's bag and vice versa. It really depends more on the build of the person uh, and, again, what warmth people are looking after. Looking yeah. For. yeah, I think that's important to, uh, to note. It doesn't matter what the label is um, as long as it's one that suits uh, your size and your shape. So another thing we're going to talk about is uh, draft tubes and, and uh, these are, as the name suggests, just um, tubes of uh, down that are placed in and around the bag. So often you have uh, a draft tube along the, the zip. Uh, if you can imagine uh, a zip being uh, a way in which air can get into your sleeping bag, so having a draft tube along the length of the, the zip will minimise uh, that draft flow. Um, and also draft tubes around uh, the, the neck and uh, just above the shoulder area um, uh, work really well, and I'm a bit of a fan of those. Um, it's nice, again, to tuck in whether or not you, you're using the hood or not. Um, it is nice to have something just sitting around the back of the neck in particular. The next feature we're going to talk about is uh, the zip, so left or right zip. And many manufacturers are doing this now. And uh, the, the, the key point is that it means that you can join sleeping bags together. So you can create a, a double sleeping bag, I guess, um, if you're camping with um, a partner or someone who is very close to you. I must admit, I have not seen this done in the last five years. I know you can do it. Uh, I know, uh, and in fact, Jill and my uh, sleeping bag, which we purchased in, I think it was around about 2014, uh, are left and right-handed uh, zips and will join together. We've never done it. Um, I think it's one of those sort of things. It's nice to have your own space. Having a when you're joining two sleeping bags together, you tend to end up with a gap in the middle, uh, which is lovely when it's nice and warm. But when it's cold, having a your own sleeping bag is going to keep you warmer than having um, having a sleeping bag with a large gap in the middle of it. Well, I don't know how you know that because you've never done it. So <laughs> we're going to have to try that one out, Tim. <laughs> So the next feature is a security or a stash pocket, and and this is uh, something that's really starting to become quite popular in sleeping bags. So essentially, as the name uh, suggests, it's a uh, concealed pocket of some kind inside the sleeping bag, and you can keep your valuables in there, or we find it really, really handy to uh, keep your phone in there so uh, it doesn't... Um, reduce the battery in cold air, or even a battery pack um, concealed in the stash pocket. So you can put whatever it is you like, uh, whatever it is that you need to keep handy, um, but it is a feature that is um, starting to be seen in many more sleeping bags. And while there are a number of other features you'll pick up on, on bags, one other main one that I'll go through and mention is the foot box zip. Um, and this is a feature, if you're only going to have one bag, this would be definitely be a feature that I'd look at getting. Um, it's designed that you can unzip just the, the bottom of the bag uh, rather than the sides. So in hot weather, you can either stick your feet out or allow air flow, flow to move through the bag and you're not going to overheat. Not something you're likely to do in the middle of winter when it's freezing cold, but when the weather's starting to warm up and you haven't quite gone to folding the, the whole sleeping bag open as a, as a, a blanket or a quilt, uh, it's a halfway step towards that. Yeah, I've got a zip on, on the bottom of my bag that's independent of the side zip and I can honestly say I've never undone it <laughs> during sleep. Where, where I tend to, but not very often. It tends to be really summertime and that's it. Now, as far as weight and size of bags are concerned, always choose the correct sleeping bag based on the warmth you need. But once you've gone past that point, try and get the smallest and most compact bag you can to minimize the weight and the bulk in your pack. Um, there are, again, there are lots of choices. Synthetic bags tend to be bigger and bulkier. Um, the high-grade, high-quality down bags 
that quite often have less features on them because of that uh, tend to be much, much lighter and much more compact. My sleeping bag, uh, which is my two-degree bag, uh, I've got a photo of it in the written version of the podcast. It is not that much bigger than a one-litre water bottle. Um, it's tiny, uh, takes up very little space in the pack, uh, and weighs around about 750 grams. So it's, it's a tiny little bag, uh, and it's something I really do appreciate, which allows me to, to reduce the size of the pack that I need to, to use as well. Compared to mine, which is the top uh, image in that photo, uh, which is huge, <laughs> yeah, and, <a laughs> and heavy. And Jill, Jill's bag is probably around about twice the size of of, of that one that I use, uh, but that's what she needs to keep it warm. So that's that's the correct one for her. The other thing I'd say here in relation to choosing a sleeping bag is budget, and we're not just talking about how cheap a bag is; we're talking about cost versus value for money. I'm a big fan of the term value for money. Uh, and to give you an indication, some of Australia's well-known chain stores, uh, I went on here just before I did this podcast, and you can buy us an adult-sized sleeping bag for $10 to $12. Um, and the carbon miles on that must be frightening, but anyway. They are very cheap, um, but you're not going to enjoy the experience. It's probably not likely to keep you warm, even in the middle of summer. Um, but, hey, if you want to go camping for one night and, you know, and it's a really hot night down the coast, go for it. You know, for the sake of $10 to $12, uh, it's not a problem. But if you are looking, are seriously looking at getting into hiking and camping on a regular basis, it's not something I'd actually recommend. So look at getting the best quality bag you can afford that does the job you need, that has the features you want. Um, and that's going to be the correct bag for you. Um, it may, I know everyone does have a budget to work with, so you don't, you know, you can't necessarily say, well, I'm going to buy two bags if you can only afford one bag and you've got other product to buy as well. So uh, work out what it is that you actually need, and this will help you to start narrowing down the range and when, when you go through and choose, uh, choose what you're looking for. So from my perspective, as I said, I do run two sleeping bags uh, at the moment. I am looking at changing my colder bag over uh, uh, early next year, uh, and I will go for an extremely lightweight but warm sleeping bag that will keep me warm in the colder temperatures. But as I said, normally once you start getting the really lightweight high-end bags, you do often lose a bit of features. So the bag I'm looking at in particular doesn't have a foot box zip, um, which means it really is a cold uh, use bag only, uh, and I'm not going to be using it in the middle of summer. I'll swap over to my other bag. Whereas if I was just using one bag, I would choose a bag that would carry me across the whole temperature range and have enough features that I can open it up, I can use it at any time of the year. And that's a, a decision that you as an individual are going to have to make when choosing a sleeping bag. Yeah, I think that's probably, and that's probably a theme of, of what we say generally is um, work out what's right for you and uh, look at the options that will give you as much as you're looking for, for the budget that you have. Okay, so as a, as a final word on this one, take your time to do the research uh, to narrow down your bag choice. As we said, there are literally dozens, if not hundreds of bags to choose from in the market. But once you decide what temperature you're looking at, what features you want, whether you want a down or a synthetic bag, what shape of bag you want, uh, what colour of bag you want for that matter, um, that's going to start narrowing down. Because <laughs> the colour is going to keep you warm. <laughs> it is, yeah. That's going to start narrowing down your choice uh, and make it easier to to say, well, okay, I've got now five or six bags. How much do I want to spend? You know, I want to get the best bag I can afford for the money I've got. And, and that might narrow you down to just a, a couple of bags then to choose from. As part of this um, uh, this release of this podcast over the next week we'll be releasing a series of reviews on a number of sleeping bags uh, that are currently on the market at the moment so go through and have a look at our website at, at some of the newer bags that are available on the market at currently 
While we've focused on the choice of sleeping bags, you will also need to consider your sleep system, which includes your sleeping bag and the clothes that you wear and a sleeping bag liner of some type. All those things go to providing a good, comfortable night's sleep. But the sleeping bag certainly, in most cases, is going to be your most expensive option and your most expensive purchase out of that. Um, and really, you're trying to build everything around a sleep system uh, and based on the sleeping bag that you've gone through and picked. So look at everything together as a, as a system rather than just as a standalone. Okay, so we hope that's uh, provided a bit of benefit for you and, and it'll make the job of choosing a sleeping bag a bit easier. Um, and, and as we said, there's a written version of this podcast which has images uh, and has the links to things like the EN rating, uh, which will make it a bit easier to understand what, what uh, uh, the specifics of that are. In next week's podcast episode, episode 135, we're going to be conducting an interview with professional uh, adventure filmmaker, storyteller and photographer, Daniel Taylor. Uh, now, Daniel recently went and joined in uh, and spent some time with Lucy Barnard from Tangles and Tales uh, and filmed and interviewed her uh, as she uh continued her journey from the bottom of South America to, to the top of North America. Um, and it was quite funny. We recently asked people what uh, uh, interviews they'd like to hear, and Daniel's name was one that came up. Uh, and we'd only just recently recorded, finished recording the interview with Daniel, and that was a few weeks ago. So listen to that great interview next week. If you've ever wanted to be a professional photographer, uh, this will be a chance to find out what's involved. As always, you can listen to this episode and our back catalogue of episodes at the Australian Hiker website at www.australianhiker.com.au, at Apple Podcasts, at Podbean, at Stitcher Radio, and many other podcatchers. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me. Um, if there's a particular temperature for the 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 women 